All right, so I finally want to talk about the uh, Fred Holm alternative, and um, this is a, a generalization of something that's fairly trivial for matrices uh, to compact operators. Um, actually, it's an extension, uh, as we'll see in a second, in a little bit, to uh, not just compact operators, but uh, eigenvalues of compact operators. All right, so uh, just kind of review some relevant stuff from linear algebra so that uh, things make sense. Let's say T uh, is an N by N matrix, right? So remember the rank plus null T theorem, which says uh, that the, uh, well, exactly, uh, the rank, which is the dimension of the range of T plus the null T, the dimension of the kernel of T is going to be N. Okay. So from this, uh, and there's other ways to prove this, a very easy fact that uh, if T, is either injective as a map on CN, as a linear map on CN. Every matrix um, defines a linear map on CN and vice versa. Uh, every uh, linear operator on CN can be defined uh, as a, it can be written as a matrix with respect to uh, whatever orthonormal basis for CN you want. So if tot t is either injective or onto, uh, then t is a bijection and thus invertible. Okay. So we're actually going to prove this uh, a little more general statement, but we're going to we're going to we're going to prove a, a generalization of this for uh, compact operators on a um, separable Hilbert space. Um, actually, we don't even need separable, right? Basically, the proof, as I'll explain in a moment, uh, works uh, for uh, box spaces. And I'll link, there's a nice link to uh, just that proof in one of Terry Tao's uh, blog posts. It's actually interesting. Terry Tao needed the Fred Home alternative for uh, box spaces, or at least for Hilbert spaces and wanted to see if he can prove it for Bonox spaces, just why not? Um, and it turned out, as he explains, that the proof he came up with uh, was already done by Barbara McClure and someone else, and that's the proof that she put in this book. And it's basically the same proof that I'm giving. It's a bit strange. She does one piece of the proof um, for Bonnock spaces and the rest for Hilbert spaces, which doesn't really make much sense to me. Uh, I'm just going to make things a little quicker, not even that much simpler, but I mean, it's a little simpler. I'm going to make things a little simple and quick and just focus on the Hilbert space case. That's mainly the, where applications are, but I'll indicate how to do this for um, Bonnock spaces. So the proof here, uh, really not much to the proof. Um, T injective uh, implies, well, the dimension of the kernel is zero. Implies the dimension of the rank is n. Implies T is onto, right? So T is onto an injective. Um, so it is uh, invertible. Likewise, uh, basically same kind of reasoning. Uh, T is onto well, if T is onto implies that uh, the dimension of the, the range obviously is n, 
Okay, we're treating T as if it's a linear map on CN from CN to CN, right? So uh, this implies that the dimension kernel has to be zero, uh, implies T injective, which means T is on to injective and hence invertible. All right, so that takes care of the proof. And uh, another, uh, you know, an equivalent statement, or, you know, basically an equivalent statement is uh, basically what's called, the, you know, this is going to be what the Fred Holm alternative is. Uh, and it's called it this way because it's an alternative. You either have one or the other, but not both. Okay, so you have two alternatives, either lambda is an eigenvalue um, and I should say uh, we're going to assume that lambda is not zero or uh, t minus um, Lambda I is invertible. Right. But not both. Right. All right, so let's assume one is true. Right, so if one is true, well, obviously that means the kernel of T minus lambda I is not zero. There exists an X where TX minus lambda X is, there exists an X not equal, not equal to zero where TX minus lambda X is zero or same thing, there exists a non-zero X where Tx equals lambda x. Obviously, that means this is not invertible. Where is one false? Um, so actually, here uh, we don't need lambda being zero. Uh, when we state the Fred Hum alternative for a Hilbert space, we do need lambda uh, not zero. Uh, but all right, so one false, uh, well, that means uh, the kernel of T minus lambda I, there are no non-zero X where TX equals lambda X. So the kernel of T minus lambda I is just zero. implies too that t minus lambda i, and I should say i, uh, maybe uh, i is the identity matrix, so really stick n by n's here, um, whatever, doesn't matter. Same thing here, uh, put n by n. Okay, so if one is false, then two has to be true. Uh, and of course, if, should say, um, if two is true, then uh, lambda can't be an eigenvalue. Uh, because if two is true, then the kernel of an invertible linear map is zero, so lambda is not an eigenvalue. So I guess I'll just quickly write that down. So what have we proved? We've proved that I, you know, if one is true, then two is false. If two is true, then one is false. So both of them can't occur. But if one is false, then two is true. So either, uh, you know, 
we have two cases. One is true, then one is true. Okay, that means two is false. If one is not true, then we prove that two has to be true, in which case one is false. So either only one of these two uh, are true, and precisely one of these two are true. All right, so um, yeah, the proof of the Fred Holm alternative for Hilbert space uh, is not too difficult. Basically, the proof of this statement here when lambda is not equal to zero. Uh, but it's just, it's a little, it requires a bunch of, uh, the book calls them theorems. I guess they're useful on itself. Uh, so I guess I'll call them theorems. Some basic facts about uh, um, about uh, compact operators on a Hilbert space. Okay. So from now on, let's say T is a bounded operator on a, a Hilbert space, not necessarily um, separable. Let's assume this is compact. Okay. Um, so the following theorem is under this assumption, if lambda is not equal to zero, uh, then, um, then the range of t minus lambda i is closed. All right. So yeah, if we're dealing with Cn, we don't have to worry about this. Dealing with the finite dimensional space, the range is always closed. Any finite dimensional space proved a few videos ago is closed. So if we're dealing with the Hilbert space, it's just a technicality we have to deal with. Um, right. So yeah, if you look in look uh, at look in the book, um, as I mentioned, my proof. Uh, well, my proofs for this video are going to be simpler than the books because even though the book does a lot in the Hilbert space setting, this is actually proved for box spaces. They look at uh, quotient spaces as a replacement for the orthogonal complement, which uh, that's the only reasonable or, um, replacement for an orthogonal complement that you can have um, when dealing with Bonnach spaces. Uh, but so, um, yeah, it'll be basically a homework exercise. I'll mention this in a minute or after I'm done everything. How to do this all for uh, Bonnach spaces. Uh, anyway, so T minus lambda I is lambda one minus lambda T minus I. And obviously uh, this is compact. one over lambda times T. Uh, and this operator T minus lambda I having closed range is the same thing as, or rather this operator here in uh, blue having closed range is the same thing as a constant, non-zero constant times this operator having closed range. So in other words, it's enough to prove the case when uh, lambda is one. Okay? We just need to prove that this operator in blue has closed range. And this is, again, this is compact. If T is compact, so uh, yeah, that loss of generality, lambda equals one. All right, so let's say S be the following map. Um, it's basically just T minus the identity, but not on the Hilbert space H. We want it to, we want to basically force it to be uh, one to one by restricting the domain. So let's restrict the domain to the kernel of T minus uh, the identity 
orthogonal complement. So this is just Sx is um, uh, T minus I X, right? So, um, oh yeah, that's not, uh, hold on. Yeah, so about that. So I'm not sure if we proved this anywhere, but uh, it only takes a second. So uh, I claim that S is injective. Why is that true? Well, um, really not much to this. If X is in this orthogonal complement, about the right script, K, And if this here equals zero, then additionally x is in the kernel. So it's basically kind of trivial. Um, sorry, it's t minus i, not i minus t. Same kernel, obviously, but still. So that implies x is zero. So this is. Um, uh, right, this is uh, injected. Right. Uh, right. So, um, yeah, S is bounded and uh, injective. All right, so also, um, so let's say X, so it also has the same range as uh, T minus I. Restricting us, restricting the domain doesn't affect the range. Let's see that. So if X is X1 plus X2, where um, X1 is in, uh, the kernel of T minus I. And this is an diagonal complement T minus I. Then SX, uh, well, it's kind of trivial. T minus I X one, T minus I X two. Well, this is in the kernel, so this is zero. Not much to that. So this is going to be S X two. Well, X two is in the, the you know, kernel of T minus I perp. So the range of uh, S uh, is a range of T minus I. T minus I is an operator on my Hilbert space. Here, S is an operator on the orthogonal complement of the kernel. All right, so uh, what do we do? Um, now let's assume that uh, range of T minus I on H 
is not closed. Right? We're trying to prove that the range is closed. Let's assume it's not. Right? So what does this mean? It means that um, the range of S is also not closed. But I gave a homework uh, a long time ago that said that if uh, a bounded operator on a Hilbert space uh, is bounded below, then the range is closed. So let me just remind you what that means. That means uh, that S X is big or equal to delta norm of X. Or rather, there exists delta bigger than zero, where this is true for any uh, x and h. Or uh, equivalently, if x is not equal to zero, just divide by norm of x. This is true for any uh, unit vector. So this is true for any x. So in other words, what do we have? We have that this is equivalent to uh, this here. For any unit vector x, the norm of Sx is big or equal to delta. Right. So, yeah, bounded below uh, implies, and actually the proof we uh, gave, very simple uh, uh, application of completeness, so uh, absolutely works uh, for a box space. That bounded below implies the range is closed. Okay. So, in other words, S is not bounded below. Okay, so S is not bounded below so that there does not exist delta positive where this is uh, true for all unit vectors X. So in other words, there exists um, vectors uh, in the... Um, Orthogonal complement of the kernel that are unit. I think I said that, um, but okay. unit vectors. And uh, the limit here, uh, basically set delta to be one over n. Uh, you can find xn where the norm of x, norm of s xn is less than or equal to one over n. So in particular, this here converges to zero. All right, so, um, right, so these are unit vectors. So we can use compactness of T. So let's say, uh, and you know, um, let me, well, I guess I'll keep S, but now we're gonna want to use the fact that this is T minus the identity Xn. So let's say, um, so let's say, uh, pick a subsequence of these, 
converging to something, uh, call it y. Let's do nk rather. Right, so now let's get a contradiction. Okay, so if this is true, then I claim that ty equals y. So uh, this is going to be less than or equal to ty. Got to be a little clever with your um, adding and subtracting. So add and subtract t squared x and k. Right. Um, yeah, so we add and subtracted t squared x and k. We're going to add and subtract t x and k as minus y norm. Um, Yeah, so uh, you can just factor out a uh, t here. So it's going to be less than or equal to the norm of t, t is a bounded operator, um, y minus tx and k converges to zero. Um, this one here, uh, second. Right, so t, uh, t xn minus xn converges a norm to zero. So this is going to be less than or equal to the norm, operator norm of t, t xn k minus xn k. T xn k minus xn k. Uh, last but not least, um, well, TXNK just converges to Y, there's nothing really to that. Thanks to compactness. This all goes to zero, so that implies TY equals Y. All right, so um, how does that help us? Uh, sorry. So that means that, um, well, that clearly means y is in the kernel. That means that y is in the kernel of t minus i. t y minus y equals zero. Um, Right, so, uh, yeah, we're almost done here. Um, so we're trying to get a contradiction that y has to simultaneous, simultaneously be zero and not zero. Okay, so y is in the kernel of t minus the identity, and that's very useful because uh, we know each xn is orthogonal to stuff in the kernel. So each xn is orthogonal to y. Let's put that to good use. Um, so what does this mean? This means... Um, Right, so what does this mean? Um, y minus x and k less than or equal to y minus uh, t x and k converges to zero plus t x 
nk minus x nk, which converges to zero. Um, so this uh, converges to zero. Okay. Well, this uh, here, as I mentioned, uh, blue, this is in the orthogonal complement of the kernel. This is closed, obviously, any orthogonal complement closed. Y, uh, XNK converges to Y, uh, so that implies that Y is in the orthogonal complement of the kernel. Oops. Well, we have y is in the kernel and y is in the orthogonal complement of the kernel. The only way that's true is if y equals zero. Only element that's in both something and its orthogonal complement is zero element. All right, uh, but this is absurd. What I have in orange is absurd. Why is this absurd? Um, well, very simply, each one of these are unit vectors. X and K converges to Y. So this converges to zero. So this converges as n goes to, uh, sorry, did I do, I meant k. I hope I didn't, uh, yeah, I, I didn't mean, I meant k, uh, sorry about that. As k goes to infinity, this is true. As k goes to infinity, this goes to zero. We just showed that uh, again. K, not, not N, K. Uh, this goes to uh, uh, zero, this term here. Right, so that means the norm of Y is big or equal to one. You can't have Y equals zero and the norm of Y is big or equal to one, right? Right, so uh, that's the end of the proof. So assuming that, um, right, so in fact, assuming that S was not bounded below gave us a contradiction. So S is bounded below and hence the range of S is closed. So it proved, I guess, a little bit more, really, that uh, um, uh, what we prove. If lambda is not equal to zero and T is compact, then uh, T minus lambda I is bounded uh, below. Right. All right, so uh, we have uh, another. I don't know why the book calls it a theorem. Uh, kind of bothers me. So I'm going to call it a lemma because it's really not. It's a technical result that I don't know how useful it is on its own. I guess I'll just call it a theorem just to match the book. All right. So. Um, Right, so again, we're assuming T is compact. So let's say MJ is the range T minus I raised to the Jth power. So it's T minus I times T minus I, et cetera, et cetera, all the way up to power J. Um, all 
So I claim that there exists uh, J, that's a natural number. where um, mj is mj plus one. All right, so what's the proof? Uh, the proof is as follows, right? Obviously t and the identity commute is you know, t times I mean, there's nothing that to that to that. So you can apply the binomial theorem. Uh, this so by the binomial theorem, this is going to be equal to uh, the sum here. Minus one to the J minus L, J choose L, T to the L. And we don't really exactly care about all of this. The, the point here is that we want to write it as the identity minus a compact operator. Okay. So this can be written uh, as uh, the identity, just when L equals zero, T to the zero by definition means the identity here. So, uh, so we can write it as the identity minus L equals zero to J. We gotta put another minus sign here. Minus one, J minus L plus one. J choose L, L. Well, this whole thing is compact. It's the linear combination of compact operators. Right. Uh, so we have I minus a compact operator. We just proved that, um, yeah, the range of T minus or compact operator minus lambda i is closed. Well, if that's closed, then lambda i minus compact operator has closed range. So i minus this compact operator has closed range. So in, in particular, by what we just proved, Um, the range of T minus I to the J, which is MJ, is closed. Right, and it's a closed subspace of H, and that's very powerful because uh, we can use orthogonal complements because we have a closed subspace. Okay, uh, so kind of mention something that's probably a bit trivial, uh, but so if y uh, is an uh, let's say mj plus one, so it's in the range of t minus the identity to the j plus one, that means we can write y as t minus j, t minus i times, uh, t minus i to the j plus one power times x, or some x in my Hilbert space, then y is t minus the identity, t minus the identity to the j power
Obviously, this is an H. Uh, sorry, I meant to do uh, this here. Yeah, this is an H. Okay. So that means this is going to be, uh, by definition, an M J. So this just proves trivially that M J is a subset of M J. Okay. So let's assume that we never. Uh, where did this go? Sorry about that. Let's assume that this is never true, that we never have these two being equal. Then we always have proper subsets. So assume for any natural number j uh, mj plus 1. is a strict subspace of MJ. Okay? It's a strict closed subspace. So we can look at the orthogonal complement of MJ plus one in MJ. Okay? So we haven't actually had to look at this, but uh, this is an example of where it's useful. And this is a notation for the orthogonal complement of MJ plus one uh, in MJ. So just all, um, well, all X in MJ, that's in the orthogonal complement of MJ plus one. So X, uh, H equals zero. If H is in MJ plus one. All right, uh, right, so I'm assuming because I have a strict, uh, a proper closed subspace, this orthogonal complement is not the zero space. Right. So whenever I have a closed, strictly, uh, uh, sorry, a closed, non-trivial subspace of a Hilbert space, non-trivial meaning it's not the zero space and it's not the whole Hilbert space, then I can always pick a, uh, I can always pick a non-zero vector in the orthogonal complement. Right. Um, right, so yeah, let's do exactly that. So pick a uh, unit xj and mj uh, uh, pick uh, in the orthogonal complement of mj plus one and mj. All right, so uh, let's write down some facts. That allow us to finish, basically finish up, uh, finish this up. So if J is less than K, then XK, well, we're picking uh, XK. Uh, in particular, it's an MK. And MK uh, is a subset because uh, K, uh, sorry, J plus one is less than or equal to K. This is a subset of M J plus one. Two. Um, T 
minus the identity times xj. Well, xj is in the range of t minus i, t minus the identity rather, to the power j. So multiply by t minus the identity again, throws us into mj plus one. So this is an mj plus one. The whole point here is we uh, want to identify useful stuff in mj plus 1, because in that case, the useful stuff that we identify is orthogonal to xj, and that'll really uh, help us a lot. Right? So in particular, we're going to actually show that there does not exist a subsequence of xj where t or there's, there does not exist a subsequent x and k where t, x, and k converges, which violates compactness. Right? So last but not least, um, same uh, logic, t times the identity of x, k, which again is an m, k. This is an m, k plus one, and that's a subset of m j plus one. Okay, so if y is t minus the identity uh, of x j, t minus the identity of x k minus x k, then all three of these, A, B, and C, tell us that um, this whole mess is in Mj plus 1. Then uh, Txj minus Txk, well, if you think about it, uh, is just going to be y plus xj. Right? So you add xj, the xj's cancel. The xk's cancel already. Uh, it might look like a txn. So these are xk's. So you add. Uh, Add xj, then the xj's cancel, and the t, sorry, the xj's cancel, and the xk's automatically cancel. So txj minus txk is going to be y plus um, uh, what is it, xj, right? So this is going to be a uh, norm of y plus x j squared, but this is in m j plus one. How do we pick x j? It's in um, it's in the orthogonal complement of m j plus one. It's orthogonal to everything in mj plus one. So in particular, these are orthogonal. We don't even care about the y squared. That's something big or equal to zero. Well, this here is one. These are unit vectors. Uh, that implies that no subsequence T and K converges. Take any subsequence, this will not be uh, Cauchy. Txj minus Txk, no matter what, as long as x is not, so as long as k is not equal to j, that's big or equal to 1. Okay. 
So that violates compactness. And the point here is that, uh, point, point is that this assumption here gave us contradiction. So we must have this being false for uh, some j. There must be some j where mj plus one equals mj. That's exactly what we proved. If not, then this is always true where I just put in, I don't know what color this is, pinkish lavender or something. If this is always true, then we get this contradiction. All right, uh, so we're, yeah, almost done with Fred Holm alternative. Um, So we're basically now at a point where we can prove, basically prove the Fed home alternative. Okay. So if lambda is not equal to zero and T minus the identity lambda uh, is not invertible, That here. Uh, then uh, lambda is an eigenvalue. Of All right, so what's the proof? Um, well, again, we can assume without loss of generality that T, uh, assuming as always in this section, this is compact. So again, here I didn't state it, but uh, this is compact. As I said, throughout this chap, this section, uh, T is compact. Um, right, so what is the proof? Um, again, lambda not being zero means that uh, T minus lambda I, and we want this, as we said uh, a moment ago, it's obvious that we want T, uh, sorry, lambda is an eigenvalue if the kernel is uh, just the zero vector space. So this is going to be lambda, uh, one over lambda t minus the identity. One over lambda times t is obviously compact. So if I can prove this for a compact minus the identity, um, then uh, I'm done. Right. So in other words, I can assume lambda uh, is one. Right. right. So, or in other words, lambda being an eigenvalue for this here is the same thing as saying that one is an eigenvalue for this compact operator. Right. And if uh, T is not invertible, then certainly this is not invertible, this operator here. Um, so, uh, yeah. Right. So without loss of generality, lambda equals one. All right, so assume One is not an eigenvalue for, uh, I guess I haven't used this notation, so I don't need to really use it. Uh, it doesn't matter. Okay. 
yeah, assume one is not an eigenvalue of T. So this kernel here uh, is um, just uh, empty. Right. So, um, yeah, so obviously T minus the identity is injective. So this not invertible implies uh, that this uh, is not onto because if T minus the identity is onto, then it's injective and onto and hence invertible. <clears throat> okay. Um, right, so you can check basically, and I'll leave this as a very easy thing to check. This, using the same notation as in uh, this, um, uh, this theorem here, particularly this MJ notation, what I'm going to put in purple here implies that, again, you're, you can check this, uh, Now, this is going to be true for any natural number j uh, well it violates the previous theory we just proved that's not true and the way you're going to do this uh, very, uh, you basically prove this by induction. It's a very uh, easy, uh, yeah, it's a very easy uh, induction. Um, rather, Yeah, it's, it's a very straightforward uh, induction um, that, right, if it's not onto, then for any J, uh, we have strict, strict subsequences. Okay, um, right, so that takes care of that proof. Okay, so, um, right, so let's uh, finally uh, prove um, basically a version of this for uh, compact operators on a Hilbert space. So actually, we're going to prove uh, slightly a bit more. Um, yeah, and I'll basically leave. Uh, I'll basically leave this here uh, as an exercise, um, proving this corollary based on what I'm about to prove, this corollary rather for uh, Hilbert space when lambda is, uh, so let me call this asterisk. So actually what I'm gonna state here is what the book calls the Fred Home alternative. I don't like calling this the Fred Home alternative because there's really no no alternative. I mean, this trivially gives you the Fredholm alternative, this asterisk for lambda not equal to zero, 
where T is a compact operator on the Hilbert space, but still um, there's really no alternatives here. It's, it's anyway, if lambda is not equal to zero and T uh, compact, then um, then either T minus lambda I or uh, injective or T minus lambda I onto implies T minus lambda I invertible. So if one is true, um, right, if one is true, and basically as we've said, you know, in so many ways, probably a dozen times by now, uh, this injective means lambda is not an eigenvalue. Right. Well, uh, lambda not an eigenvalue means T minus lambda I is invertible by the previous theorem. Just directly. It's the contrapositive of the statement that we just proved. Uh, now two, um, let's assume T minus lambda I is on two. So by really old homework, and it's a surprisingly, yeah, everyone got this homework right. It's a very easy, yet extremely powerful result. Uh, the range of any really bounded operator uh, on a Hilbert space uh, well, the range of the adjoint orthogonal complement is the kernel. So I don't care what op bounded operator this is, this holds for any, uh, basically anything whatsoever. Well, our first theorem in this uh, section, or this video, or not this video, um, but uh, in, in this discussion of the Fredholm alternative was that uh, if T is compact and if lambda is not equal to zero, which we're assuming, then T minus lambda I is closed. The range rather is closed. Right, so because this has closed uh, range, what can we do? We can just take uh, basically, um, well, this was literally the homework. So we can replace this operator here with the adjoint. So um, let's do that. And we can take the orthogonal complement of both sides. And you know that for any closed subspace of a Hilbert space, the double orthogonal complement is just that closed subspace. So this says that the range of T minus lambda I is, so I can fit this here, the kernel of T minus lambda I adjoint orthogonal complement. So why does this help us? Well, we're assuming T minus lambda I is onto. 
So that means uh, basically that the orthogonal complement here is the whole Hilbert space. So that means, well, the whole, if the uh, orthogonal complement is the whole Hilbert space, that means that the kernel inside this orthogonal, or the whatever inside the orthogonal complement, T minus lambda I adjoint, has to be the zero uh, vector space. So again, we're assuming that this here is my whole Hilbert space, right? That's our assumption, that's what two says. Well, we just proved, well, we proved a while ago that, um, So this is T star minus lambda bar times the identity, right? And this is compact. This is not zero. Lambda bar is not zero if and only if lambda is not zero. So what we just proved is that whenever you have a compact minus a non-zero lambda times the identity, whose kernel is the zero vector space, or in other words, it's injective, that means this is invertible. So that means T minus lambda I adjoint is invertible, which is true if and only if T minus lambda i is invertible. Yeah. All right, so I won't write it down, but uh, yeah. Um, so, um, right, so basically I'll leave it as a homework exercise to prove this here for um, a, a uh, compact operator T on a Hilbert space H where lambda is not equal to zero. So this here, this alternative here is true. Either lambda not equal to zero is an eigenvalue of T or T minus lambda times the identity is invertible. This is true. Um, T is compact. Lambda not equal to zero, uh, and um, yeah, it's true if T is compact and lambda is not equal to zero. Okay. And last but not least, um, so how do you prove this for a? Uh, how do you prove this for a box space? And I'll leave that as an exercise. Um, the proof is basically done in the book for Bonnock spaces. You replace orthogonal complements by quotient spaces. So I mentioned in the video on quotient spaces and the C, uh, or, and, and if you forget, go look at that video. I mentioned there that the whole point of, or the main point of quotient spaces is that they are a useful replacement for orthogonal complements. So this Fred Holm alternative, in, or, or you know, in particular, uh, this theorem here, this last theorem, uh, this here holds on a Bonnock space. Everything I did has, uh, basically everything I did works for a Bonnock space if you replace orthogonal complements with quotient spaces. Okay. Okay, so uh, in particular, I guess I'll just erase the very first page. Um, kind of remind you of how this goes. Uh, 
Um, so remember uh, that if uh, M is a closed subspace of a Hilbert space, I should do that. Uh, what the hell happened there? Then uh, we have that um, the orthogonal complement is isometrically isomorphic to um, H, the quotient space H mod M. So for Bonnock spaces, I said replace um, orthogonal complements. It's a little more work, but basically the idea is all there. And again, the book actually doesn't use orthogonal complements. I thought it would be easier, but the book actually does everything in terms of quotient spaces. Um, it actually would have made this quite a bit longer, I think, or a little bit longer. So we'll replace orthogonal complements with uh, quotients. So what, in, in that sense, this is a really beautiful application of quotient spaces, proving this highly non-trivial Fred Holm alternative for Bonnock spaces. Okay. So, uh, and by that I mean, this is true exactly what's here on a Bonnock space. T is compact, lambda is not equal to zero, then either lambda is an eigenvalue of T, or T minus lambda times identity is invertible. All right, uh, I think this is a good place to leave off. Uh, and if you want to learn more about functional analysis, uh, begin chapter five on Banach and C star algebras. Um, and um, yeah, uh, just. I left off at the very end of chapter four. So uh, you definitely have all the tools to, to read the rest of um, Barbara McClure's book, particularly because we've very closely followed uh, Barbara McClure's book. So um, if you ever want me to teach another course like this, just talk to Professor Kwan and I'll be happy to do it. All right, so long, take care, have a good summer, bye-bye.